Welcome back. We are now going to switch switch gears again because we have breaking news on the Paul Manafort trial. This is the case out of Virginia where former campaign man manager Paul Manafort is standing trial. And we have Colin Kalmbacher there covering this for us live on his feed. Hey, Colin, great to see you. I know you're covering that uh, from head to toe. So give us the update on all the points you want us to know. We so appreciate you being there with us. So far, the four or so hours, uh, he will probably be finishing up uh, his testimony sometime after lunch. Uh, the prosecution is just about done. That'll give a lengthy amount of uh, cross-examination time. Of course, there'll be a redirect and recross, most likely, since this is the prosecution's star witness. But so far, Rick Gates has testified, and in a way that he has kind of, I think, hopefully for the prosecution, I would imagine, clarified a lot of the really dry, weedy, technical tax, uh, income tax issues, the alleged bank fraud, the alleged uh, mortgage fraud, uh, income tax hiding schemes, things of that sort. And so we've seen or we've heard, well, both, testimony from Gates today uh, that essentially has, uh, you know, made the buck stop right at Paul Manafort. The buck starts there, stops there. Everything that Rick Gates has testified he's done was at the behest of Paul Manafort. So that includes, like I said, the general tax avoidance scheme. And then he's gone into depth and detail about all of these, uh, I guess, various uh, moving parts of what was necessary in order to keep the, this income from these Ukrainian oligarchs, even though that's a word that we're not allowed to say in Judge Ellis's courtroom, at least not in front of the jury. Um, all these payments from Ukrainian oligarchs uh, to uh, Mr. Manafort and uh, Davis Manafort Partners International, and, and keeping that uh, unpatriated, that is, not declared as income in the United States. And so there have been uh, basically, I'd say, three or four ancillary or subsidiary issues just that have been necessary to effectuate, uh, to effectuate this broader scheme of keeping the money away from uh, the tax authorities in the United States. And how do you think it's going for the prosecution? Do you think Rick Gates is a credible witness, or is it pretty obvious that he took a plea and maybe has some other motive in giving this incriminating testimony against Paul Manafort? Well, I mean, it's, very, it's, it's completely obvious because um, they're laying the foundation for who Rick Gates is and was. Um, the prosecution went through a lengthy recital of what got him to this point, why he's testifying, um, what he did leading up to the, his testimony and his, um, I guess, cooperation with the government. Uh, included in that was Rick Gates basically copping to quite a bit of crimes that the government was apparently unaware of. Um, maybe, they, maybe they knew about them, maybe they were waiting for him to tell, but uh, Rick Gates has been very open about being a liar and an embezzler himself Ultimately, that, of course, is going to be a jury's call. Uh, the defense is going, I, I would imagine, they're licking their chops at the fact that Gates has admitted to embezzling hundreds of thousands of dollars from both uh, Mr. Manafort and from his previous employers on top of that. So, tough call. Right. And are you in the courtroom following this live constantly, uh, or are you in and out? I, I am constantly in a courtroom. It has up until today been the actual courtroom. A flurry of interest locally, uh, not seen since I think the first day of the trial. Pretty much all of the, I don't know, I'm not gonna actually quantify it, but quite a few journalists that I've seen in the, in the, uh, the, red, the actual courtroom, like me, were shoved into overflow today just because I guess so many DCers and Virginians were ready to see the fireworks erupt. And, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's necessarily happened. I've actually seen quite a few uh, non-press folks leave out. It's, it's, it's still fairly dry, but um, Rick Gates is, like I said, clarifying a lot of these issues, I think, in a way that's easier for the jury to understand. Okay. And we do need to cut out to a break. So thank you so much for course, joining Christian, us no live and letting us know what's going on. We appreciate the inside view in the courtroom. But we're going to continue to follow this trial and others here on Long Crime. Stay tuned and stick with us. Welcome back to Long Crime. 
I'm Carissa Kranz, and we are going to continue with what we were doing before the break with our very own Colin Com Combacker. Colin, I know before the break you were discussing. Sorry if I, I messed up your last name there. I, we were just yeah, we were discussing um, in detail a little bit about why Paul Manafort. Uh, was evading these taxes or how he was doing it, and you were giving some insight into what was going on in the courtroom with that testimony. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to give us that insight here on the air for our viewers as well. Absolutely. So, you know, that's there is the broader tax avoidance scheme, and uh, to that point, Rick Gates has been testifying that Paul Manafort essentially directed and knew about the fact that he was underrepresenting his income that he was not um, checking off all these boxes that he needed to check off on his tax uh, returns about his offshore accounts, that he was uh, not aware of, uh, or that he was aware that he needed to file certain other statements to the effect that he had those accounts. Um, but some of the, uh, I guess, more intricate details here are how exactly this was hidden. Um, the income was hidden and not declared, never declared. One of the ways was basically classifying income as loans that never existed in the first place. Those loans that never existed um, were listed instead as, of course, since they were loans, as liabilities on general ledgers and other accounting documents. And then when the, um, I guess, Davis Manafort uh, Partners International, uh, Paul Manafort's business, eventually needed to represent the fact that they had more income than they did, because in later years, the Ukrainian money pot was kind of running a bit dry. Um, those, those non-existent loans in the first place were then, I guess, doubly forged to create uh, underlying loan documentation for, like I said, again, and I know I'm repeating myself, loans that never existed in the first place. So you have forgeries on top of forgeries. And that leads me to, I think, uh, one of the more interesting things that I suppose happened last week was when we were seeing... Uh, repeatedly forged invoices to vendors. Um, the vendors testified they'd never seen these invoices. They were obviously fakes. The defense even admitted they were fakes. In fact, that was a terminology that we were finally supplied by the defense, quote unquote, fake invoice. Um, and they were obviously faked because the vendors' names were misspelled. Um, the addresses were off. They listed services that the vendors didn't actually provide or perhaps were listed in a much more general way than the vendors themselves ever would have referred to them. And again, the vendors also testified, yeah, I've never had any dealings with these companies. So there was some confusion exactly what role these forged invoices had played in the overall scheme. Today we learn that uh, bank accounts um, and attorneys in the Grenadines had a slightly more thoroughgoing, I guess, uh, documentation regime than the Cypriot, uh, Cyprus banks, or Cyprus bank accounts, rather. And so essentially these St. Vincent Grenadines accounts and accountants and lawyers and banks, they needed to see one piece of paper, just one, that listed the payment coming to going from the name of the vendors in question. Because once again, or well, not once again, but to explain a little bit, Paul Manafort was buying lavish things like ostrich suits and uh, flowers in the shapes of his uh, initials for his Hamptons uh, property. And he was paying for them, you know, these is all alleged and spoken to in the courtroom, paying for them by international wire transfers from businesses which he owned and controlled, or essentially entities he owned and controlled. They weren't actually businesses. They didn't exist for any other purpose than to move Paul Manafort's money around. And so the banks in Cyprus needed to see that they weren't paying for Paul Manafort stuff. They needed to see that they were paying for the names of the entities on the accounts that Paul Manafort was using. If that's too confusing, maybe you can ask a question to clarify. I know I just dropped a lot. Well, there. I do have a question because okay. it is confusing. And my question is more about how do you think the jury is taking this since you're in the courtroom looking at that jury? Yeah. Um, the jury does seem more or less engaged. It's hard to tell. No, nobody's like, um, you know, nobody has their phones. They can't wander off and go the way that most people in the modern age signal they're not paying attention. But uh, 
like I said, a lot of this stuff is very weedy. It's very dry. But Robert Gates has been able to kind of clarify a lot of that. Do you feel like the jury is processing this? Because what you're saying shows that there was an intent to evade, an intent to defraud, and that he knew exactly what he was doing, and this was an organized right. scheme, and therefore he should be found guilty if you believe the prosecution's case. Do you feel like being in the room and watching the jurors, that they're, they're absorbing that, or are they tuning out because it's over their head? It is a lot of information. They, they do seem to be absorbing it. There aren't, there aren't really any tells so far, though. Uh, you know, whenever there's a joke in the courtroom, the jury laughs like everybody else. But it, I haven't seen, you know, really any light bulbs go off. Um, it's, I, I can't really weigh in whether they're taking this at all and understanding it. I would just say that the, the past day and a half of testimony has made it quite a bit more obvious what all this documentation we've seen for the past week and a half or so actually means in context. Mm -hmm. So uh, the prosecution has been a little bit more efficient um, than they were last week, this week. Uh, but whether that ultimately is, um, you know, going off as, as like an aha moment for any of the jurors, hard to say. Okay. And any final thoughts before we switch gears here back at Long Crime? Because we're covering a few trials here today. Uh, well, we, we saw Paul Manafort staring uh, his former friend and longtime partner down once again, uh, just giving those those dead eyes. And um, he, he's not having a good day in court. He's basically seeing one of his longtime buddies and, a, and, a, and accomplices, if you believe the prosecution, sure, uh, basically laid all him. on the line. And that's that's never easy. So, um, yeah. Why do you think he didn't get a plea deal? <laughs> Mr. Manafort? Um, yes. I don't think he wanted one. I think he thinks uh, he, he may have a decent enough case here. Uh, like I said earlier before the break, they are licking their chops about uh, combing through Rick Gates' testimony and his admitted lies. Um, prosecution has established that uh, Rick Gates knew where all the bodies were hidden, but the defense's job is to make it look like it was all on him in the first place, whether that's because they want to make him look like an incompetent liar or, or something else. It's uh, yet to be decided. We'll see in a couple hours. Well, we so appreciate having you there live, giving us this special report and update. It's been great to have you on two days in a row, and we look forward to having you back as we continue to follow this trial and others here on Long Crime. So thanks, Colin. Thanks, Marissa. Take care.